sure that we are streaming. Yes, we are live. Okay. Very good. Okay, let's go. All right. Baby, ask us to dream of 
Shimad, his divine grace of Ayah, Channa of Bhaktivedanta, Go Sami, Shila Prabhupad Kijai, Yaskan founder Acharya, Shila Prabhupad Kijai, Anantakoti Vaishnav Rindigijai, Namacharya, Shila Harila Stakur Kijai, Purem Say, Go Sri Krishna Chaitanya. Prabhu Nichananda Shidwe Rigarad Ha Shiva Siddhi Gaur Vakta Vrindiki Jai Shishi Radhakrishna Gopi Gopanath Shayama Kunda Radha Kunda Giddy Govardhan Ki Jai Vrindavanam Ki Jai Maturadam Ki Jai Jagadatha Sami Ki Jai Munamai Ki Jai Shimandala Siddhavi Ki Jai Samaveda Vakta Vrindiki Jai Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Bo all glory is the assembled devotees, all glory is the assembled devotees, all glory is the assembled devotees, all glory is to she. Guru and Gauranga, Shila Pumbad, Kijai, my own Vishnu Padaya, Krishna, Pristaya Bhutai, Shivati Bhaktivedanta, Sarma, Namani, Namaste, Saraswati, Deva, Gauravani, Pacharni, Nivasesha, Sunyavadi, Pashacha, Deja, Tarni. Let me read the translation. The lotus feet of our spiritual master are the only way by which we can attain pure devotional service. I bow down to his lotus feet with great awe and reverence. By his grace, one can cross the ocean of material suffering and obtain the mercy of Krishna. My only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from his lotus mouth. Attachment to his lotus feet is the perfection that fulfills all desires. He opens my darkened eyes and fills my heart with transcendental knowledge. He is my Lord, birth after birth. From him ecstatic prema emanates, by him ignorance is destroyed. The Vedic scriptures sing of his character. Our spiritual master is the ocean of mercy, the friend of the poor, and Lord and master of the devotees. O master, be merciful unto us. Give us the shade of your lotus feet. Your fame is spread all over the three worlds. Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. So, without further ado, we will continue with our reading of the Chaitanya Bhagavat. Okay, so we just heard about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's marriage to Vishnu Priya, his second wife, a very elaborate marriage, Whew. completely elaborate, and I just found it very interesting, of course, Shilvakti Sananta Saraswati Thakur says, we do not imitate this particular procedure. It's a traditional procedure, like many traditions, and we can integrate sometimes different traditions into some of our practices, and some of them are not necessary. So, uh, in fact, many of the Bengali traditions are not necessary in Krishna consciousness. In other words, unless you're Bengal, you don't have to do an Uru when you're ecstatic. Uru is Uru. <laughs> but in Bengal, that's a sign of ecstasy or a sign of happiness or whatever. So you don't have to do that in every Iskon temple just because it's a Bengali thing. We're not trying to be Bengalis. We're not trying to be of any particular nationality or culture. We're trying to be Krishna conscious. And being Krishna conscious means we can adapt, adopt certain cultural things if the host culture that we happen to be in uh, considers those things to be important. We can adopt them. 
as long as they don't contradict our basic practices and principles of Krishna consciousness. For example, in America, we shake hands. In India, you go, namaste. Okay. So we can adopt certain things, but not everything. So, yeah, Krishna consciousness is transcultural. I do about that. You know, so, anyway. Of course, <laughs> certain cultures during the marriage, they drink wine or liquor. We don't adopt that during our marriage ceremonies. So we can have some grape juice. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go on to the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Omagana, Timiranda Shah, Gananjana, Shilakaya, Chakshur, and Medita, Yena, Tazmai, Shigurave, Maha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Shila Prabhupada, who so kindly open my eyes with transcendental knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. Okay, let us share the screen. And let's see, where is that screen? It is down there somewhere. I know it's there. Because I see it. Mm -hmm. Oh, show all windows. There it is. Here we go. Hmm. All righty. Give me one second. Okay. Okay, that's really it. Whoops. So, uh, oh, sorry, just the English. You're equal to everyone, both friend and enemy, but there's no one in the three worlds who can understand you. You're free to go wherever you wish. You may stay in the cave on the bank of the Ganges or wherever you desire. Of course, this is, just we'll go back a little bit. This is the uh, Muslim ruler talking to Haridas Thakur. But the last, last uh, class, we talked about Haridas Thakur's pastimes of being beaten in 22 marketplaces. And when he was beaten in 22 marketplaces, he did not feel any pain, was thrown into a river because they thought he was dead. I'm just summarizing the story. Came out after some time and continued chanting and was not hurt at all. And so the Muslims were so impressed. The head of the Muslims, it was the Qazi or whatever, uh, said, you know, you're a great saint. You're free to do whatever you want. You may stay in a cave in the back of the Ganges or wherever you desire. Now you may stay wherever you like and do whatever you please. What to speak of the upper classes? Unseen, the lotus feet of Haridas Thakur, even the Muslims forgot themselves. They had angrily taken him to be killed, but they ultimately accepted him as a powerful saint. After glancing mercifully on the Muslims, Thakur Haridas entered Pulia. As he loudly chanted the names of Hari, he arrived before an assembly of Brahmanas, Seeing Haridas, the Brahmanas were filled with happiness. The Brahmanas then began to chant the names of Hari, and Haridas began to dance in ecstasy. Haridas displayed endless ecstatic transformations like crying, shivering, laughing, falling unconscious, hair standing on end, and roaring. Then, in ecstatic love, Haridas crashed to the ground. Seeing this, the Brahmanas began to float in ecstasy. After a while, when Haridas became pacified, the Brahmanas sat around him. Haridas then said, O oh, Brahmanas, please listen. Don't feel sorry for me. I've heard so much blasphemy of the Lord. That is why he has punished me. So this is a really interesting point. That Haridas Thakur 
thought, I deserve to be whipped and punished like that because I heard blasphemy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this is very similar to that verse in the Bhagavatam. Uh, yeah, Tatsenum Kampam Shushim Mada. So uh, that when a devotee uh, experiences some reverse of this world, he takes it as a token reaction for his previous activities and still goes on serving Krishna. That's really important. Hmm. So, Hridvag Vapur Vir Vedadam Namaste Jiveta Yo Mukti Padesa Dayavak. He goes on serving Krishna not only externally, but with his heart, his body, and his mind. I'm satisfied for whatever happened to me was for my benefit. The Lord has relieved me of my great offense by awarding me a token punishment. Wow. Of course, he never committed an offense. And Krishna protected him all the while he was being punished. One who hears blasphemy of Lord Vishnu is sent to hell, known as Kumbi Paka. And with my sinful ears, I heard so much blasphemy of the Lord. Shoo. Therefore, the Lord has given me an appropriate punishment so that I may not commit such sins in the future. Thereafter, such humility. Thereafter, Haridas and the Brahmanas fearlessly enjoyed congregationally chanting the holy names of the Lord. The Yavanas who had beaten Haridas as well as their families were all destroyed within a few days. And that's also because a devotee may forgive you, but the dust of their feet don't forgive you. Then Haridas went and found a cave on the bank of the Ganges. He remembered Krishna day and night as he resided alone in the cave. Hmm. He would chant the holy name of the Lord 300,000 times a day. Ooh. 192, almost 192 rounds. And his cave was thus transformed into Vaikuntha. A huge snake lived within that cave, and no living entity could tolerate the burning atmosphere produced from its poison. As a result, anyone who visited Haridas in his cave could not stay for more than a few moments. They all felt intense burning from the poison. But Haridas was again completely oblivious. The Brahmanas sat down together and considered... What is that burning sensation in Haridas's cave? There were some expert physicians living in Pulia. When they came there, they could understand that the burning sensation was due to the presence of a snake. <clears throat> a physician said there is a big snake somewhere inside the cave. No one can remain here due to the effects of its poison. This is our assurance. Therefore, Haridas should immediately go somewhere else. It is not wise to live with a snake. Let us go to his cave and inform him. Then they all went to see Haridas to explain the situation and request him to move. There is a big snake living in this cave, and no one can remain here due to the effect of its poison. Therefore, it is not wise to live here. Please find another place to stay. Haridas replied, I've been staying in this cave for many days, but I haven't felt any burning sensation. But since you are all suffering and unable to tolerate the burning of the poison, I will leave tomorrow for another place. If there is a snake in this cave and it doesn't leave by tomorrow, then I'll leave and go some other place. Don't worry. Let us all chant Krishna's names. <laughs> as soon as they began to perform kirtan, a wonderful incident took place. Hearing that Haidas was prepared to leave the cave, the large snake immediately left. It was early evening as everyone there saw the snake leave the cave. The large, wonderful snake looked most fearful, but it was also very beautiful, being colored yellow, blue, and white. As the Brahmanas saw the brilliant jewel adorning its head, they fearfully remembered Krishna was obviously some sort of expansion of Seshanag. After the snake left that place, the Brahmanas were overjoyed to find that the burning sensation was gone. 
They all appreciated Haridas's marvelous potency and developed great devotion for him. It is not very glorious that a snake left its cave simply on the request of Haridas Thakur. Simply by his glance, one's bondage born of nescience is destroyed. Even Lord Krishna does not transgress the words of Haridas. Wow. Now, please hear another wonderful incident that was narrated by the king of the snakes. This is a beautiful story. One day, a snake charmer was dancing in the courtyard of one wealthy man. His associates played the murdanga and a flute used for snake charming as they loudly sang on all sides of the snake charmer. The snake charmer was absorbed under the influence of some mantras that he was chanting. By providence, Haridas came there and began to watch the snake charmer from the side. By the power of the mantras chanted by the snake charmer, the king of snakes had appeared in the body of the snake charmer and was happily dancing. So the uh, word Nagaraja, the king of snakes, means Shesha, the devotee of the Lord Vishnu, Ananta, or Vasuki. Uh, so, you know, Shesha, who is... Vishnu Tatla was appearing there. Wow. The, in the body of the snake charmer. The snake charmer was loudly and sweetly singing about Krishna's dance in the Kaliya Lake. You all know that story. As Haridas heard the glorious pastimes of the Lord, he fell unconscious to the ground and his breath stopped. When he regained consciousness some moments later, he roared loudly and began to dance in ecstasy. Seeing Haridas's ecstatic mood, the snake charmer stopped his dancing and stood off to the side. Takur Haridas rolled on the ground, and wonderful ecstatic symptoms like hair standing on end, crying, shivering, became manifest in his body. Haridas was fully absorbed in ecstatic love after hearing the transcendental qualities of the Lord, and tears of love flowed from his eyes. Then everyone surrounding Haridas joyfully began chanting Krishna's glories while the snake charmer respectfully stood to the side with folded hands. After Haridas returned to external consciousness, the snake charmer again began to dance. Everyone was overwhelmed with joy after seeing Haridas's ecstatic absorption. They all eagerly took the dust from his footprints and smeared it on their bodies. Wow. One pseudo-Brahmin who was in the audience thought, I will also dance today. Even an illiterate fool who dances like he's in ecstasy is greatly respected by common people. Thinking in this way, he immediately crashed to the ground and became motionless. As soon as the pseudo-Brahman fell near the dancing snake charmer, the snake charmer became angry and began severely beating the Brahman with a stick. After being beaten with a stick all over the body, the anguished Brahman ran away screaming. Father! <laughs> Thereafter, the snake charmer happily continued on with his dances. Everyone there watched in astonishment. Later, they all folded their hands and asked the snake charmer, please explain to us why you beat the Brahmana. And why did you stand aside with folded hands when Haridas was dancing? Then the serpent devotee of Vishnu spoke through the mouth of the snake charmer about the glories of Haridas. You have asked me about a mysterious subject. Although it is confidential, I must disclose it. You all felt great reverence for Haridas when you saw his ecstatic dance. Seeing this, that pseudo-Brahman fell to the ground in an envious imitation of Haridas, who has the power to enviously disturb the pleasure of my dancing. Hmm. Out of audacity, he tried to imitate Haridas, and therefore I punished him accordingly. He presented himself as an important person by imitating some religious sentiments. You find that all the time. Actually, that arrogant and deceitful Brahman has no love for Krishna. To achieve devotional service of Lord Krishna, one has to be free of duplicity. Hmm. No politicians there for you. One who sees Haridas dancing is freed from all bondage. 
When Haridas dances, Lord Krishna personally dances. Thus, the whole universe can be purified by seeing his dance. His name, Haridas, is appropriate for Lord Krishna constantly dwells in his heart. He is affectionate to all living entities and he is always engaged in their welfare. He accompanies the Lord whenever he incarnates. He is never offensive to Vishnu or the Vaishnavas and even in a dream, he does not deviate from the proper path. One who associates with Haridas for even a fraction of a moment will certainly attain shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva always desire to associate with a devotee like Haridas. On the order of the Lord, Haridas was born in a low-class family to show that birth in a high caste or good family are useless. If a devotee of the Lord is born in a low-class family, he is still worthy of worship. This is the verdict of scriptures. And if someone born in a high-class family but does not worship the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, then his high birth is useless and he falls to hell. Haridas thus took birth in a low-class family to prove the words of the scriptures. Haridas was born in a low-class family just as Pallad was born in a demoniac family and Hanuman was born in a monkey family. The demigods desire the touch of Haridas, and even Mother Ganga desires that Haridas immerse himself in her waters. What to speak of his touch? Just by seeing Haridas, one is released from the bondage of fruit of activities. Indeed, even if one sees a person who has taken shelter of Haridas, he is freed from material bondage. If I glorify Haridas for a hundred years with a hundred mouths, I would still not reach the end of his glories. You are all fortunate, for because of you, I received an opportunity to glorify Haridas. I assure you that one who simply chants the name of Haridas without offense will certainly attain the abode of Krishna. After speaking in this way, let me just, after speaking in this way, the king of the snakes became silent and all the pious people there felt fully satisfied. Thus the Vaishnava snake related the glories of Haridas Thakur. By hearing the snake's narration through the mouth of the snake charmer, all the people felt great affection for Haridas. Let me just turn that eye off right now so I don't get disturbed again. Haridas Thakur passed his days in this way before Gora Chandra manifested his devotional feelings. People throughout the world were devoid of devotional service to Lord <laughs> Vishnu. They had no understanding of the meaning or goal of Kirtan. There was no trace of devotional service to Vishnu anywhere. Everyone simply taunted the Vaishnavas. The devotees would meet together and chant the names of Krishna while clapping their hands. The miscreants became most indignant even at this. Those atheists would meet together to blaspheme the devotees. These brahmanas will destroy this country and bring about famine. These brahmanas perform sentimental kirtan and play various tricks in order to beg alms. Hmm. The Lord takes rest for four months during the rainy season, but these brahmanas loudly call him even at that time. If the Lord's sleep is disturbed, he'll become angry and create a famine in this country. There's no doubt about it. Someone said, if the price of rice increases, then I'll catch them and give them a punch. <laughs> Someone else said, on a codice, these devotees stay up all night and chant the name of, Gorin of Govinda. What is the need for chanting the Lord's name every day? In this way, the atheists condemn the devotees in various ways. The devotees all felt aggrieved on hearing these things. Yet none of them gave up <coughs> chanting the names of Hari. Haridas was particularly aggrieved to see the people's lack of interest in the process of devotional service. In spite of this, Haridas continued to loudly chant the holy names of the Lord. The most sinful miscreants were even unable to hear this loud chanting. In this regard, there was one impious Brahmana who lived in the village of he once angrily said to Haridas, 
Oh, I read us. What's this behavior? Why are you loudly chanting the names of the Lord? <laughs> the injunction is that one should chant in his mind. Which scripture says that one should chant loudly? Now, this is actually quite interesting. There was a deviant group who chanted a mantra, and the mantra said you should chant Hare Krishna softly. <laughs> there, of course, there are the Nittai Gaur Radisham Chapa Hare Krishna, you know, Baja Nittai Gaur Radisham Chapa Hare Krishna Hare Ram. So, in other words, you could chant Nittai Gaur loudly. But chant Hare Krishna very, very softly. And so that deviant group had a temple right next to ours. I don't think it's still there, maybe it's still there. But anyway, and every night they'd be chanting this mantra, it would drive you crazy. And Prabhupada disliked that mantra so much. And Bhakti Sananta Saraswati Thakur disliked that mantra so much that what do they do? Prabhupada chant, oh, changed our um, Panchatatwa Maha Mantra, at least the introduction of the Panchatatwa Mantra, from Bhaja Shri Krishna Chaitanya to Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya, just so we wouldn't have any, like, even indirect or implicit connection with these people. Uh, okay. The injunction, actually, is to chant loudly. Uh, Kali Kalera Dhamma Krishna Nama Sankirtan. That's in the Chaitanya character. Read that in the Bhagavatam. Kalera Delshan Hey Raja Nashi Gomadhana Kirtanad Eva Krishna Shamukta Sangha Parambaja. Who has given you, taught you to chant the name of Hari loudly? Please give your explanation before this assembly of learned Brahmanas, scholars. Hari Das said, you all know the glories of Lord Hari's holy names. Therefore, I have simply repeated and will repeat whatever I have heard from you. <laughs> if one chants loudly, he gets 100 times more benefit. The scriptures never condemn loud chanting. Rather, they glorify it. That's funny. If one ch loudly chants the holy names of the Lord, he obtains 100 times more benefit than by chanting softly or remembering the holy names. Hare Krishna! You. The Brahmin said that doesn't mean we should chant our japa so loud that it drives everyone else crazy. Japa is meant for soft chanting, personal chanting. Brahmin said, How does one get 100 times more benefit by loud chanting? Haridas replied, My dear sir, listen to, the, listen to the verdict of the Vedas and Srimad Bhagavatam in this regard. Haridas then revealed the purport of all the scriptures as he began his explanation in the ecstasy of Krishna consciousness. Listen, dear Brahmins, if even animals, birds, or insects hear the holy name from the mouth of a pure devotee, they will go to Vaikuntha. Hmm. Anyone who chants your name purifies all who hear his chanting as well as himself. How much more beneficial then is the touch of your lotus feet. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful verse. Although animals, birds, and insects cannot chant, when they hear the holy names, they will all be delivered. If one silently chants the names of Krishna, then he is delivered. But if one loudly chants, then he delivers others also. Therefore, the scriptures say that one gets a hundred times more benefit by chanting loudly. One who loudly chants the holy names of the Lord is a hundred times greater than one who silently chants, because those who chant silently purify only themselves, while those who chant loudly purify other, uh, who chant loudly purify themselves as well as those who hear them. This verse was spoken by Pallad Maharaj in the Naradiya Purana. Wow. The Puranas say that a person who chants the Lord's name loudly is a hundred times more pious than the person who chants to himself. Oh, Brahmana, listen carefully to the reason behind this. One who softly chants the holy names liberates only himself. One who loudly chants the names of Govinda, however, liberates himself along with all living entities who hear him. Although all living entities have a tongue, only the human beings are able to chant the names of Krishna. That's true. Tell me, 
What is wrong with that activity by which living entities who have taken useless births will be delivered? One person may maintain himself while another may maintain a thousand people. Because this reminds me of the story of Sripad Ramanujacharya, who was given a mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya, uh, and told by his guru, don't share that mantra because if anyone else hears it, they'll get liberated. So this is my instruction to you, my dear disciple. So what does Ramanujacharya do? As soon as he receives that mantra from his guru, he goes to the highest building in the city and yells out, anyone who wants to get liberated, chant this mantra with me, and he gives everybody the mantra. The guru comes back very, very angry. He said, you have committed a guru aparada, an offense at the lotus feet of Guru Dev, and therefore you are going to H-E double hell. H-E double L and H-E double hell. <laughs> Sounds like similar. H E double hell, H E double hell. So anyway, so you're going to <laughs> wherever you're going. And Ramanujacharya says, I am willing to go to hell as long as everybody else gets liberated. And the guru embraced him and said, You are greater than me. You are my guru. Of the two, consider loudly who is better. This is the superior characteristic of loud chanting. After hearing the words of Haridas, the Brahmana began to angrily blaspheme him. Now even Haridas has become a philosopher. I can see the Vedic culture is being destroyed by the course of time. Because I try to understand that uh, according to the caste system, only Brahmanas are allowed to study philosophy. Everybody else forget about, especially Shudras especially the outcasts. It is stated that Shudras will explain the Vedas at the end of Kali Yuga, but why only at the end of the age? I can see it happening even now. Well, there. To consider a Vaishnava, a Shudra, is a mad elephant offense. Yes. A Vaishnava, to consider any Vaishnava to be a Shudra. Hmm. Acharyam, Bani, Navya. One who sees the guru to be of a particular caste or a devotee to be of a particular caste is possessed of hellish intelligence, just like one who sees the deity as being made by, made of stone. Hellish intelligence. So this Brahmin has, so-called Brahmin has hellish intelligence. This is how you advertise yourself. So you can eat nicely at others' houses. If the explanation that you have made is not true, then I will cut off your nose and ears. Woo! What an offense he's committing. Uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, this particular story, was told in the assembly house of the Majundras, uh, of Govardhan and Haranya, who were the father and the uncle of Raghunath Das Goswami. So, so there's the particular context of the story is given in the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita. So anyway, and his name was Gopal Chakravarti. Hmm. Is this particular Brahmin's name? In the Chaitanya Charitamrita describes it. Hearing the words of that sinful Brahmin, Haridas smiled and chanted the names of Hari. He did not speak further to that atheistic Brahmin, but left immediately while loudly chanting the holy names. The sinful members of that assembly were all wicked-minded. They neither supported the authorized statements of Haridas, nor did they protest the offensive words of the Brahmana. So they were all indirectly responsible, so they had to be punished. They were Brahmins in name only, actually they were all demons fit to be punished by Yamaraj. Wow. In Kali Yuga, demons are born in the families of Brahmanas in order to harass the saintly persons. Woo! Commentary. Though demoniac persons were envious of Vishnu and the Vaishnavas may take birth in Brahman families, they are none, none nevertheless envy the Vaishnavas. This is the specialty, speciality of Kali Yuga. In Kali Yuga, 
This is from the Brahma Purana. In Kali Yuga, demons will take birth in the families of Brahmanas to harass those rare persons who are conversant with the Vedic way of life. The scriptures forbid one from touching, speaking to, or offering respects to such Brahmins. There is no need to speak further on this. There's no need to speak further on this. Even by mistake, one should not touch or speak to those Brahmanas who have no devotion for the Supreme Lord. Just as one in this world should never see a dog eating chandala, one should never see a non-devotee Brahmana. One who converses with a non-devotee Brahmana loses his piety. Wow. Within a few days, that wretched Brahmana was attacked by smallpox, and as a result, his nose melted and fell off. Now, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's leprosy. That he had. I mean, it's a little bit different for us. But the story is basically the same. The punishment he had proposed for Haridas Thakur was awarded to himself by Krishna. <laughs> Aggrieved to see the entire world absorbed in sense gratification, Haridas would sigh deeply as he chanted the holy name of Krishna. In other words, Haridas Thakur wasn't happy. Oh, yeah, he got it. No. He was feeling very much aggrieved to see this Brahmin suffering. That's a real Vaishnava. That even if the Brahmin is suffering due to his offenses, Haridas Thakur is not thinking. This is great, Krishna did it. He's praying for his benefit. It's like Pallad Maharaj prayed for the benefit of his father, Aranya Kashipu. So let's. All right. After a few days, Haridas went to Navadweep with a desire to associate with the Vaishnavas there. All the devotees of Navadweep were overjoyed on seeing Haridas. Upon obtaining the association of Haridas, Advaita Charya treated him as dear as his own life. So Advaita Charya had previously associated with Haridas in Fulia, which is near Shantipur. So he knew him already. All the Vaishnavas showered their affection on Haridasa and he reciprocated with great devotion. They discussed amongst themselves the burning offensive statements of the atheists. Then devotees constantly discussed with each other the topics of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. One who reads or hears these topics will attain the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord Gaurasundara. Accepting Sri Chaitanya Nichananda Prabhu is my life and soul. I, Vrindavan Das, sing the glories of their lotus feet. Thus ends this English translation of the Gaudiya Vasha commentary in Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat Adikanda, chapter 16, entitled The Glories of Haridas Thakura. Haridas Thakura Ki Jai. Next chapter is chapter 17. The Lord's travel to Gaya. That's where he took initiation. So let's go through. We're not going to read the chapter summary because then all the suspense is lost. Okay. All glories to the Supreme Lord, Sri Gaurasundra. All glories to Nityananda's beloved Lord who possesses an eternal body. All glories to the Lord whose life and wealth of the Vaishnavas, of all the Vaishnavas. Oh Lord, please deliver the living these by your merciful glance. O oh, brothers, listen carefully to the topics of Adi Khanda, which describe the Lord's journey to Gaya. In this way, the Lord of Aikuntha resided at Navadweep as the crest jewel of teachers. As the number of atheists increased in Navadweep, it became difficult to even hear the mention of devotional service. The devotees were all distressed to see that people were simply attached to illusory pleasures. Although the Lord was absorbed in study and teaching, he noted the devotees' distress. He heard how the miscreants were constantly blaspheming the Vaishnavas. The Lord thus desired to manifest himself, but he thought he should first visit Gaya. The supremely independent Lord Agorasandra desired to see the holy place of Gaya. So there's the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu in Gaya, and also it's a Buddhist place too. After performing the Shraddha ceremony, Shraddha, Shraddha ceremony for his father, according to scriptural injunctions, the Lord departed for 
yeah, with many of his students. The Lord first took permission from Mother Sachi and then happily left to see Gaya. So the way the Lord explained this to his mother is he was going to Gaya to do the pinda for his father who had passed away. And you do that at the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu, which are in Gaya, the imprint of the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. As the Lord passed through various towns and villages on the way to Gaya, they were all turned into holy places by the touch of his lotus feet. The Lord and his students conversed, joked, and discussed various religious topics, and after a few days, they arrived at Mandara Hill. The Lord first saw the deity of Madhusudan at the top of the hill and then wandered about the hill according to his desire. While traveling like this, one day the Lord manifested a fever. Interesting story. In order to instruct people, the Lord of Vaikuntha displayed a fever like an ordinary person. When the Lord manifested his fever halfway to Gaya, the hearts of his students were filled with anxiety. They tried to cure him with various remedies, but by the desire of the Lord, his fever did not subside. Then the Lord prescribed his own medicine. If I drink the water that had washed the feet of a Brahmin, my suffering will be relieved. The Lord then drank the water that had washed the feet of Brahmanas in order to reveal its glories. As soon as the Lord drank that water, his fever subsided and he felt relief. According to the Vedas and Puranas, it is the nature of the Supreme Lord to drink the water that has washed the feet of a Brahmana. Wow. Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmana Taija Jagadutaya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha. As all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects of the son of Prita. The Lord desires to be the servant of anyone who always desires to be a servant of the Lord. Wow. That's his reciprocation. Let's see. The Lord is therefore known as Sebaka Vatsala, or he who is favorably inclined to his servants. He accepts defeat in order to increase his devotees' glories. Mm. The devotees have only the Lord as their protector. Therefore, how can they give up his lotus feet? After being cured of his fever in this way, the Lord and his students came to the bank of the holy Pun Punhua River. Mm. After taking bath and offering oblations to his forefathers, Sri Sachidandana entered Gaya. As the Lord entered Gaya, the king of holy places, he offered obeisances with folded hands. Thereafter, the Lord came to Brahmakun, where he took bath and offered oblations to his forefathers. The Lord then entered Chakraveta and quickly went to sit his feet of Lord Vishnu. Countless flower garlands were stacked like a temple dome on Lord Vishnu's footprints, which were surrounded on all sides by brahmanas. Unlimited sandalwood paste, flowers, incense, and cloth had been offered at the lotus feet of the Lord. The brahmanas appeared like divine beings as they described the glories of the Lord's lotus feet. Lord Shiva accepted these same lotus feet in his heart, and these same lotus feet are constantly served by Lakshmi. These lotus feet are on the head of Bali Maharaj, O fortunate souls, now see those same lotus feet. One who meditates on these lotus feet for even a moment never comes under the jurisdiction of Yamaraj. These lotus feet are rarely attained even by the best of yogis. O fortunate souls, see those same lotus feet here. The Ganges emanated from these lotus feet, and the servants of the Lord constantly keep those lotus feet in their hearts. These lotus feet are most enchanting on the bed of Vinanta. O fortunate souls, now see those same lotus feet here. Hearing the glories of the Lord's lotus feet from the Brahmanas, the Lord became absorbed in ecstatic love. As the Lord looked at those lotus feet, tears flowed from his lotus eyes, his hair stood on end, and he began shivering. Okay, we'll stop shivering now. And we'll allow you to unmute yourselves if you have questions. And we'll continue with this story tomorrow. Very, very interesting. Whew. Very interesting discussion. So happy we're reading this. 
Okay, Diaradika, you have a question. You can unmute yourself. Hare Krishna Gurudev, please accept my obeisances. Um, my Hi. question is regarding like the residents of Navadweep. I was under the impression yeah. that they were all like elevated and advanced souls because they're able to witness those pastimes. But now, you know, we're reading about like the atheists and all the people who are committing offenses. So is that for the sake of pastimes or are those their true sentiments? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> uh, but even, even in Brindavan, you had demons there. So there must be some demons there in, in Navadweep. And there are actually real demons in Krishna's pastimes that Krishna kills. So, of course, Krishna engages, at Lord Chaitanya engages these demons in Krishna's service, in his service. But, uh, you know, sometimes the demons, they can enter, at least appear to enter the Holy Dham, and then they can cause some disturbance for devotees. I mean, just like Vrindavan was attacked by the Mughals who destroyed so many temples and caused the devotees to take the deities away. So somehow or other, demons are allowed to enter. Uh, that's Krishna arranges that. Of course, they can't really enter the real essence of the Holy Dham. You know, just like if, if you have a uh, three-dimensional location, but you only go to the two-dimensional aspect of it. For example, okay, let's say uh, I tell you in New York, well, let's use a funny example here. Let's say I tell you that there's someone I want you to see on the 30th floor of Trump Tower in New York. <laughs> yeah. And I give you the address, you know, whatever, Trump Tower, one rascals. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> whatever that street is hard. <laughs> I don't even know which avenue or street it's on. But I give you the address, and I say, you go to that address. So you go to that address, but you can't meet the person because you I haven't told you it's on the 33rd floor, or they don't let you in. You could be at that address, but you're not allowed in. So it's something like that, that they can be there, but they, they really can't enter into the mood of the Holy Dom. But for purposes of pastimes, then the Lord uh, interacts with them in different ways. Mm. So there, are, there are people who are demoniac, and I, actually we've experienced that too. I mean, I was in, in Mayapur when we were attacked by all of these villagers who were a different religion, and they were holding scythes, and you know we all had to take shelter in this big building. And so fortunately, someone had a gun he shot it in the air and they all ran away anyway so that was interesting so yeah sometimes it can be that okay thank you next question is gorali ledidi in sarva city you can unmute yourself Hare krishna gurudev please accept my humble Hare Bhav. uh gurudev i was uh, listening to the part where in text 284 um, Sri Chaitanya Prabhu, Mahaprabhu is saying that those who chant silently uh, versus uh, who, who chant loudly. Now there are some of us who you know do some rounds when we are on the train to work, and you know we can't chant, chant loudly for you know right right various purposes. So uh, is it? Like, I mean I know Gurudev. You always say that when you are chanting, you should chant loud enough. So that you can hear the sound, right. the beautiful sound that's coming out. But then uh, there's always this conundrum: how loud can you chant? Like maybe civility? I don't know. Yeah, go to the. Yeah, you can chant very softly, so you can hear. I mean, I can chant softly, so only only I can hear. Yeah. You know, chant. You know, sometimes whisper chanting if necessary in circumstances like that. I mean, I have. I travel by plane, obviously, a lot, and I can't be chanting very loud job on the plane. So, yeah, there's certain extenuating circumstances. What What is specifically mentioned here is not in relationship to japa, per se, but it's in relationship to the kirtan, apart from japa. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so obviously, you're not going to have kirtan on the train 
or the bus as you're going to work, that would be uh, counterproductive. I mean, yeah. it might be I mean, I have no objection to it, but uh, you might get yeah. thrown off the train pretty quickly. So, uh, <laughs> so you got to be practical. You know, have your cure time where you're not going to get in trouble. Yeah. We're not like Haryas that core that you know. Oh my God, we get thrown in jail or beaten up. We're going to just tolerate it. Yeah. So we have to. We can't overreach our own level of realization. You have to understand your level of realization. If you're hired out stock glory, then you can go, or like this <laughs> one of Lord Chaitanya's associates, get out of plant, uh, not get out of the get out of dust, who went to the Kazi and told the Kazi to chant Hare Krishna. He told him at night, you know, woke him up. <laughs> so, you know, if you are on that level, go for it. But <laughs> most of us, we have to really be careful. <laughs> That's my humble advice. <laughs> okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Had a good. How do you Okay. So anybody else have a question? You can raise your hand or type in the text window, chat window, we call it. Oh, Saki Sundari. Okay. You have a question? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Jai Shri Ram. Uh, Maharaj, I have one question. When was uh, we'll do the chanting? So chanting mala have a, a smaller bead beat and bigger beat and when we'll start the beat as the smaller beat and we'll end over the bigger beat so that's the any reason why it's the start is the smaller beat and then we'll end over the bigger beat no no actually we're supposed to start wherever we start and then reverse okay so you say it doesn't really matter the only reason there's smaller beads and bigger beads is so basically, you know which direction you're going. <laughs> yes, Prabhuji Maharaj. Which direction we have to start is that we'll start the smaller beat and bigger. No, you can start with the bigger beads, the smaller beads, whichever, whichever you like. In fact, sometimes you have that you have beads that don't aren't bigger or smaller. They're all the same size. Yes. So which is all right. There's no there's no ritual at smaller beads or bigger beads. You know, you start from the beginning, right near the head bead. The head yes. bead is, is the bead with the hair on it. Therefore, yes. it's called the head bead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And Thank then, you. Then, and then you, you continue. And then when you reach the end, don't cross over the head bead. Then yes. you come back in the other direction. Yes. All right? Yes, mother. Thank you, mother. All right. Thank you. Interesting question. Okay. So this, we have to end now. It's time. Thank you very much. All glories to his divine grace. Shilapabupad, Shilapabupad, Kijai, Gopre, Mananda, Haribo.